We've covered films from a lot of different decades on Cinema Nippon so far, from 1957's Bakumatsu Taioden all the way up to 2015's Our Little Sister, and technically 2017's We Are X if you count the shorties. But today, I feel like we should do something special. Let's go back. Way back. Way, 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 way back. To a time before color, before sound. To look at a film which is bizarre, it's strange, it's innovative, it's a page of madness. Tenosuke Kinagasa was born in 1896 and found work initially as an onagata, a man who plays female roles, traditionally in kabuki theater. In Kinugasa's case, though, he was an early onagata in film. Kinugasa worked for Nikatsu, one of Japan's four big production houses, throughout the 1910s and 20s before female roles began to be filled by, well, women. Kinugasa then assisted one of Japan's pioneer filmmakers, Shozo Makino, on several productions. A few of Makino's many films still exist to this day in varying degrees, which is a miracle as many films from this era are lost. But in 1926, Kinugasa set out to make his own film, financing his own camera and development lab in his home for the project. And while he was set on directing, Kinugasa was not a writer, and needed to find one for his trailblazing experimental project. Kinugasa approached the then recently formed Shinkan Kakuha, roughly translated as the New Impressionists, a group inspired by Western literary trends which sought to overhaul the face of Japanese literature, creating what they called a new literature. This new literature was intended to be more direct in its expressions of human nature. Of the members of Shinkan Kakuha, Yasunari Kawabata, a then recent graduate in Tokyo Imperial University's English program, was the one to respond. Kawabata was already running the literary journal Bungei Jidai, or The Artistic Age, which was the voice of the group. He would go on in 1968 to win the Nobel Prize for Literature, making him the first Japanese citizen to win the award, and the only Japanese winner until Kenzaburo Oe also won in 1994. Despite having its scenario penned by such a prestigious actor, A Page of Madness has one problem. There's no dialogue seen on screen, nor any explanation of the actions. That's right! Save for one brief moment halfway through the film, there is no text given to us to help determine what's going on. A modern audience might assume that this was part of the film's experimental nature which in fact has led to a persistent rumor that this was an innovative move for Kinugasa to take with the film. But that has been denied on multiple occasions, particularly by Marianne Lewinsky, one of the preeminent authorities on the movie. She explains that A Page of Madness was no exception to the contemporary tradition of the Benshi, where a Western audience was used to having a live soundtrack outside of the film and title cards, also called intertitles, placed throughout the film to explain conversations, actions, and settings, the Benshi would eliminate this need by simply telling the story, backed by musical accompaniment. The Benshi tradition has also been credited for Japan's relatively late adoption of the pre-recorded motion picture soundtrack. Japan's first sound film was released in 1930, a full three years following the release of The Jazz Singer, the first film ever to have sound. In spite of this, Benshi remained popular into the 1930s, in some cases even finding work in the early 40s. And on that note, it was actually the assistance of Musei Tokugawa, one of the most prominent Benshi working in the mid-1920s, that helped Kinugasa get A Page of Madness released. As the film exists today without a Banshee, and as we know of no recordings of the Banshee scenario for A Page of Madness, we'll be referring to the English translation of Kawabata's text to help us understand the film. A Page of Madness is notorious for being nearly impenetrable at points, so hopefully this will help clarify some things. It's important to note, however, that while the scenario provided the basis for the film, the manuscript that Kawabata wrote was not followed to a T. The film was changed in production by a few others, leading to perhaps the more appropriate credits of the writers being Kawabata, Kinugasa, and two other crew members for the film, Banko Sawada and Minoru Inuzuka. Kinugasa was known to direct for hire between his more independently financed projects, as was not uncommon in studio directors, leading to a total of 123 directorial credits to his name. The actors in A Page of Madness, as well as Kawabata, all refused payment for their work to help the production see completion. 
Shochiku, who had already established themselves as one of the major studios, allowed the film to be shot at their location, where filming took place in May 1926. After only a month, a cut of the film was completed and was screened publicly for the first time in September 1926. Following said release, however, the film was thought lost for decades due to studio disasters as a result of earthquakes and bombing raids during World War II, destroying numerous negatives of old films stored in Shochiku's vaults. However, as luck would have it, Kinugasa discovered a print and negative of the film in his storage shed in 1971. Depending on who you ask, either the film was missing scenes or Kinugasa set about recutting the film upon rediscovering it, for reasons known only to him. Either way, this resulted in the loss of about a third of its original runtime. Given how old A Page of Madness is, you might think that the film is difficult to find, but it's actually not. It's kind of difficult to find exact information on its copyright status, whether it's in the public domain at this point or not but no one is selling official copies of the film inside nor outside Japan. Adding to this, in 2006, a Japanese court ruled that most films produced and released prior to 1953, whether produced in or outside of Japan, are in the public domain within the country. And, with the use of only one intertitle in the whole film, it's not as though there's going to be a language barrier. Either way, I recommend you track down a copy of the film and watch it for yourself. Draw your own conclusions as to what is happening before we go and spoil what we think is going on, based off of our observations and Kawabata's translated script. Two versions exist today, one being about 60 minutes and the other 78 minutes. The former seems to run at about 20 or 21 frames per second, while the latter runs at 16 frames per second. It's really up to you which you might watch, but I recommend the 78 minute version as it seems closer to the original speed of the film. Anyway, let's jump right in. A Page of Madness opens with an extended sequence of a storm intercut with exterior and interior shots of the asylum, in which the bulk of the action will take place. And then we see, uh, uh, is, is that? I think that's a wizard. Yeah? Yeah, that's a wizard. Uh, I'm not really sure what she's doing. Oh, okay, okay, I see what's going on here. We're seeing a woman who's having delusions about being a self-insert in her Harry Potter fanfic when really she's just cutting a rug to the sound of the storm outside. We see through the powers of superimposition that she hears the various elements of the storm as instruments. And I mean, just look at her. She's really tearing it up. She's really feeling herself. But apparently not someone whose picture she has taken the time both to cut up and place on her wall. The sequence is really quite ingenious as, even without any sound whatsoever, the filmmakers are able to induce the illusion of sound through motion and suggestion. But let's add some sound, why don't we? This silence is a little... eerie. Plus, I mean, this is the 21st century, right? <laughs> Eventually, she feels herself a little too much and collapses, her feet bloodied. We're then introduced to another patient, an older woman who also appears delusional as she sees a sailor visiting her in her cell, though we can see that the door never opens. She then sees a baby screaming in a pipe. Kojima, you hack! You stole PT from this movie made 90 years prior. Anyway, this lovely lady is played by Yoshie Nakagawa, who would later appear in Kinugasa's other silent passion project, 1928's Jujiro, known commonly in English as Crossroads, as well as Kenji Mizuguchi's The Story of the Last Chrysanthemum. Anyway, the man she saw as a sailor appears in earnest, and here we meet our main man, who we'll be referring to as the janitor, since he isn't given a proper name throughout the film. It's not explicitly stated since, you know, nothing is explicitly stated, but the janitor is actually this woman's husband and has taken the job at the asylum to remain close to her. He tries speaking with her, but she steals one of his buttons and we see that she is further delusional since she thinks the button is a hair clip. It's implied here that, earlier, the janitor made it home to discover his wife drowning their infant child, while another woman tried to stop her. From Kawabata's manuscript, we learn that the wife has been driven insane by the janitor's long absences as a sailor. The other woman seen in this flashback arrives as well, and again through the manuscript we can learn that the woman is another of their children, played by Ayako Ijima, who as far as I can tell never appeared in another film. 
The daughter continually argues and discusses something with the janitor, but we're never enlightened without a benchy as to what they're going on about. Kawabata, however, explains that the daughter is seeking marriage, and that she has come to speak with her father, worried over the implication of having someone who has been declared insane within the family. There's a boy with her as well, who might be her brother? It's never made clear exactly. Oh, I see. Looking at the manuscript, we can learn that this boy is actually the son of the gatekeeper for the asylum. A montage ensues where we meet the main doctor of the asylum, as he visits all the patients in succession, perhaps treating them as best he can. He speaks with the wife, all the while shooing the janitor away, implying that he doesn't know they're married. The manuscript confirms that this is the case. We see through the wife's hallucination that she believes herself to be looking into a mirror that doesn't exist, still the same woman she used to be. She attempts to use the button as a hair clip again, but just can't seem to get it to stick. We then follow a group of patients and visitors outside as they walk around the grounds. The wife and daughter are given similar framing here, perhaps to better showcase the similarities between them, especially given the daughter's aversion to having mental illness so close to herself. Through Kawabata's manuscript, we can learn that the father and daughter are here talking about her upcoming marriage. We also see the mother standing in a fashion very similar to how the woman stood in the torn photograph from earlier. There is a man here who I don't think we're supposed to like very much, seeming to preach to the other patients until he is subdued and carried off by staff. Meanwhile, a number of patients begin to take an interest in our dancing friend, whose feet seem to have healed since the previous rug cutting. So many people file into the hall outside her cell, in fact, that a damn near riot erupts, with both men and women freaking out over her. Later in the scene, she seems to practically be taunting the male members of her audience, with a hairy beast of a guy front and center as she repeatedly comes close enough for them to touch her through the bars before dashing back inside. The riot gets broken up with the help of the doctor and the janitor. The doctor seems upset with the janitor, perhaps because he took out his aggression on one of the patients during the riot. The daughter returns home to visit her fiancé, while the janitor sees a parade that leads into a trippy light show and the only intertitle in the entire film, which reads, Big Lottery. Here, the janitor wins the first prize, which as the manuscript tells us, is a tansu chest, a type of mobile system of drawers used for transport in Japan. This is then, according to the manuscript, given to the daughter as a wedding present. The janitor again visits his wife, this time offering her the key to her cell, which she doesn't recognize and seems overall disinterested in. The janitor watches some boys playing outside who are imitating the inmates of the asylum. He is then visited by his daughter, who has gotten engaged or married, without informing him prior. There is a scene in the script which didn't make it into the film, where the daughter goes back to her fiancé and he is informed by a friend that her mother is in the asylum, at which point this scene involves her mourning the loss of her engagement. However, without this scene present in the film, it's unclear exactly why she comes back if it's because he's broken it off or because she regrets marrying him. Either way, they appear to argue and she leaves. The janitor then tries to break his wife out, this time more forcefully. His wife is terrified of leaving and he is unable to get her out of the building. Oh man, the phantom pain looks amazing. Those animations are just so fluid. Anyway, the woman makes it back to her cell, at which point the doctor finds the janitor's key ring in the hall. The janitor tries to bring her some water and to convince her to leave so that their daughter can get married without the blight of mental illness being within their family. The janitor recalls something that his daughter said and yet again tries to leave with his wife. This time, however, he is caught in the act by some female patients, then the doctor, then the nurses of the asylum. He fights the doctor, seriously injuring, according to the script, killing him with a broom and is downed by some of the patients. The janitor then fends off the others as the entirety of the asylum staff and patients seems to amass within the hallway. The daughter seems upset with her father for his actions and then, oh, oh my, what, what is happening? You, you lost me. So there's a procession that seems to be composed of ghosts, then some cars show up, then we think it's a hallucination, but then there are actual cars in the hallway, and then everyone is wearing a hat, and then the guy that the janitor doesn't seem too keen on is in the car with his daughter and wife? And mind you, we just saw the janitor knock this guy out, possibly killing him. And then the doctor is escorted away by a hearse, along with everyone else who just died, despite them still being indoors. 
and then the janitor wakes up. Oh, okay, I, I got it, I'm, I'm following again. The janitor has a laughing fit and distributes masks to all of the patients, and... Okay, I'm lost again. These mask designs are used heavily in no plays. No being a type of play originating in the 14th century in Japan and continuing today. Masks are commonly used by actors as visual signifiers of each character archetype. They use a system of almost colloquial iconography, where the culturally savvy viewer can understand who someone is personality-wise without ever having to see their actions. Ingeniously, these no masks are typically designed so that they display different emotions depending upon the angle at which the audience views them, meaning that an actor can emote even behind a mask. According to the translated manuscript, the Okame and Hyotoko masks seen here on a lot of the patients are supposed to represent country folk. Simple people, but happy. Perhaps drawing a correlation between these people and the blissfully ignorant Hick stereotype. They don't know any better, they're simply happy. Most of the women wear a waka ona mask, which represents the epitome of feminine beauty, while the dancer wears either an okame or otafuku mask, the first representing good fortune, and the second being a girl who brings happiness to everyone. The janitor meanwhile dons an okina, or hakushi kijo mask, which represents a wise old man. Everyone in the scene tilts their head back, which signifies that their masks can be viewed at the angle which displays happiness. He and his wife put on masks of their own and seem to laugh at the camera, perhaps implying that the janitor himself has gone insane. But then he goes about his daily duties as though nothing has occurred, leading us to question what exactly we've just witnessed. We see a parade of patients in front of the janitor, including his wife and the dancer. The man who appears to have been his least favorite bows before continuing. The janitor continues with his job and we're left to wonder, since the doctor is in good health and not upset with how the janitor has supposedly been treating him, was all of this a greater delusion? Is the janitor himself the insane one? Was the janitor ever even married? Or did he simply dream up the whole thing? Pretty spooktacular, right? Which I think is appropriate, especially given that it's so close to Halloween. Um, it's July. Well, I'm writing this two days before Halloween, so... <laughs> Dude, you wrote this almost a year ago? Shh. Let's examine, first of all, why A Page of Madness is significant for Japanese film. The film clearly represents a different era of filmmaking given the style and effects used, yet it also presents a situation that we might recognize from the rest of our show so far. We've covered several directors who have talked about working on both major studio and independent films in the same breath. The same goes for actors, who it seems will typically not discriminate against a project based solely on their promised salary, if the role they are taking is one which interests them. While the role of the daughter is filled by a relatively unknown actor, our leading man, Masao Inoue, who plays the janitor, was a director himself, with 1917's The Captain's Daughter, as well as an actor prior to this film's production. It's fascinating to see how A Page of Madness, in a lot of ways like this, foretold the state of Japanese film for the century following its release, including collaborations like this between unknowns and named actors. While A Page of Madness was foretelling of Japan's later film industry, it also speaks much about its origins. Film in Japan began as an extension of stage plays. In fact, the oldest known footage ever produced in the country is a three-minute clip from 1899 of a kabuki performance. Yasunari Kawabata's manuscript for A Page of Madness reads like a hybrid between a stage script and a choppy, modernist short story. Not giving directions per se, but denoting what we as the audience should see, rather than concerning itself with pacing or framing. It's a notable bridge between the formatting of a play and that of a later, more standardized screenplay. Inoue was an actor who migrated to the screen from the then-recent school of stage play known as Shinpa, which placed a focus on contemporary settings and issues while maintaining a Japanese feel, something like a marriage of traditional Japanese theater and Western stage plays. Unfortunately for Japanese film history, we in the West have a tendency to deify any movement toward what can be seen as a more Western style, and to declare that anything which came before or which deviated from this eventual style as merely experimental or non-modern, as is the case of many older Japanese films. This is especially true if said films borrow any elements from the stage. 
So while A Page of Madness was somewhat avant-garde, we would have the tendency to proclaim it as archaic and experimental for these very reasons. Earlier we talked about how we in the West had the misconception that A Page of Madness was experimental for its lack of intertitles. Well, there's another common misconception that goes beyond that, that Banshee was somehow a holdover from Kabuki. While in fact, puppet theater known as Bundaku had narrators, but Kabuki has no such performer. Instead, Banshi were actually introduced to provide context to imported films in the early 1910s, where they would explain the films to audiences who couldn't read the intertitles in foreign languages. Over time, their jobs simply evolved to those of complete storytellers, both for foreign and domestic films. In this way, again, A Page of Madness is somewhat standard for the period. All of that being said though, A Page of Madness was a groundbreaking film for the time, just not for the reasons one might think. It is a film that both experimented and used a number of the effects and tricks that we had invented or discovered by this point, including superimposition, cross-cutting, fades between scenes, Dutch angles, and some simply amazing pre-steadicam tracking shots. Like, look at how steady this is. All of these technical elements are used so effectively that you barely even need someone to explain the film to understand what's going on. Sure, the finer points, like the straight dialogue scenes, might be harder to decipher, but the general plot is fairly straightforward, given how strong of a grasp on the language of cinema Kinugasa had, even in the infancy of said language. From a filmic standpoint, A Page of Madness is wildly ahead of its time. It is also, however, culturally important and, as mentioned before, strangely predictive. Throughout the 20th century, sentiments regarding mental illness seem to mirror those of the daughter in the film, with issues being stigmatized largely because it was believed that they were a choice or relative to one's personality, rather than their genes or circumstances. Even as recently as 2005, during a study on public sentiments, the belief was popular in Japan that people displaying nervousness and weakness were more susceptible to mental illness. According to another study, the public tends to believe that those who are mentally ill cannot recover from their afflictions. In this way, we can imagine how conditions must have been 80 years prior to those surveys, when mental illness was understood even less well. Remember a few episodes back with Blue Christmas when we talked about xenophobia and nonconformity and the fear that results from these things? A Page of Madness gives us a window into a similar situation, with those who had mental illness around the time of the film's production being viewed as unwilling to be a part of society. It could be argued that the filmmakers did not agree with this point, as we enter both the minds and the delusions of those who have these illnesses, seeing the dancer and the wife as they see themselves, exploring their minds and having the audience sympathize with their struggles rather than writing them off. Not to mention how affected the janitor is by his wife's condition, his face always expressing pity and sadness, never condemning her for making the decision to be insane. In the 1980s, several cases of the mentally ill committing public attacks were sensationalized in the media, leading to a wider spread belief that mental illness leads to violence. This intensified the stigma as it turned mental illness from a blemish on one's family image into a threat of violence. In 1984, a scandal entered the news media where horrific conditions came to light at a Tochigi prefecture mental hospital known as Hotokukai Utsunomiya Hospital. Several patients were so abused by staff that they had died, and the causes of death had been falsified to protect those responsible. The International Commission of Jurists, in cooperation with Japanese activists, wrote to then Prime Minister Yasuhiro Nakasone, appealing to the government for action. In the words of a 1987 article concerning the incident, Nakasone did not reply, implying that how Japan treated its mentally ill was its own business. As far as popular media coverage goes, A Page of Madness may have been far ahead of its time, also because it was one of the first, if not the first, Japanese film to tackle this taboo subject of mental health care in Japan. Even as recently as 2008, with Kazuhiro Soda's documentary Mental, which offers a candid look inside a psychiatric outpatient facility, the film was marketed as taboo-shattering, while more than 80 years prior, A Page of Madness was challenging popular perceptions of these issues. More recently, some changes have begun to take place in the system, leading to a potentially easier social life for those afflicted with mental illness. In some cases, like the most heavily stigmatized illness, 
schizophrenia. A simple reclassification and renaming of the disease provides those diagnosed with a disorder rather than a disease an out in a social setting. This change helps explain their issues as legitimate problems beyond their control, rather than the choice or the problem that can be cured that it was viewed as some years back. I ran across a similar phenomenon when researching Shinjuku boys, where transgender individuals in Japan have expressed a preference recently to being officially diagnosed with gender identity disorder, as it provides a formal reason for their living as the gender opposite of that which they are assumed to be. In previous years, without a formal diagnosis, their peers might simply see them as weird or acting out. Not to say that being transgender is a mental illness in any way, it just drives home the point of importance in formal diagnosis for uncontrollable parts of oneself within a society like Japan. Public sentiments might be changing too, as in a review of studies done between 2001 and 2013 on mental illness in Japan, the researchers found that even though public education on mental illness is not widespread within the country, younger employers were generally more tolerant of mental illness in employees, and that once someone had employed a mentally ill citizen, their likelihood of employing another mentally ill individual greatly increased. So maybe people, as they seem to be worldwide, are becoming more understanding and slowly moving away from the stigma that we can see exemplified in the daughter's storyline of A Page of Madness. Well, I'm glad we could end this on kind of a happy note. Join us next time when we'll be having sort of a retrospective on the 1920s. That's right, we're not exactly moving out of the decade yet, we're just getting a future view of it. Thanks for watching, everybody. I promise you that August is not going to be as full of feels as July was. Let us know in the comments below, if you've seen A Page of Madness, what do you think? And what do you think of Kinugasa's other work in general? That's gonna do it this time, guys. Thanks for watching. See you on the next one. Yeah.